Okay, so we'll start our next panel now. Uh, this panel is about uh, the hidden secrets in M&A, how, how do you make money? Uh, I will introduce the moderator, Sunil Grover, and then um, he will introduce the panelist as well. So Sunil has over 20 years of investment banking and technology business operations experience. He is currently the founder and managing partner of True Blue Partners, which is a mid-market M&A advisory firm for entrepreneurs in enterprise software and services. Uh, Sunil himself has been a successful entrepreneur as well. He has an MBA from Chicago Booth, MS uh, from Washington University, and BTEC from IIT Bombay. He has also authored several patents. So with that, Sunil, take it away. Thank you, Jay. So the topic for today's panel, we try to keep it a little spicy, uh, making money, how, how money gets made in M&A, some of the hidden secrets. Let's uh, get started by just a show of hands so we have a sense of you know, uh, what the interest level and what topics would be most interesting. We can, we can talk about a lot of those things. How many people have experienced uh, either by being in a company that's been sold or being in a company that's acquired another company? So just a show of hands, how many people have experienced M&A? So that's around 50%. Uh, out of that, how many of you were involved in the specifics, nuances of, of the transaction when it was happening? So, you know, I'd say 10, 10, 10 of the audience are good. So there are some secrets, there's some like, you know, you know, dark magic that happens and suddenly, you know, two companies combine and, and, and when I was starting out in my career, uh, that was fascinating to me on, on how so much value that got created over many years got captured or not. Uh, let me ask a different question. How many people in the audience are uh, in different stages of the company's life, cy life cycle, either thinking about or have just started a business? Entrepreneurs in the audience. So I'd say what, around 15, 20%? And then how many in you know, a stage of the company is post-revenue or, or uh, growing at a healthy clip, looking to exit post-revenue? And then closer to the exit side, not yet, okay. That gives us a good sense of, of what the uh, you know, composition is, and, and we want to keep this interactive. We let you ask questions. There's a mic. Uh, there are two sections that are planned that we could talk about. One is how does a business, when it's getting sold, get valued? You know, you've got uh, you know, on the buy side and the sell side, and I'll have the panelists introduce themselves here in a minute. And then we'll talk about what can you do at different inflection points of your company building process. So, uh, Muddu, uh, let's start with you. Give us, give the audience a background in uh, your personal background, a background in M&A, and then Sareen. Good, good afternoon. I guess not, people didn't have enough masala chai outside. <laughs> Where is IIT guys, man? Just wake up. All right, so with this, uh, my name is Sudhakar Muddu. I've been an um, entrepreneur for a while. I work in big companies and startups. Uh, lately, I'm doing a lot of investments and take a, I'll describe you later on throughout the panel. Uh, I take what is called a common board seat at the companies, representing the company, the people, and the team um, as a fiduciary duties, and that's been what I've been active for the last uh, couple of years now. Thank you. Thanks, Muddu. Manish? Yeah, my name is Manish. So um, I spent 10 years in investment banking, was at J.P. Morgan Merrill Lynch uh, for 10 years, did a few years at HP, and then for the last six years, uh, I'm at a cybersecurity company called Proofpoint. We're public, uh, about six billion market cap. Fairly acquisitive in my five, six years, we've bought 18 businesses. It's a very exciting time to be in cybersecurity, just lots of innovation, and happy to cover how we look at companies and how we go about making sure we derive value out of the acquisitions. And those, are, those are very modest introductions. You know, for, for people who are often listed in the Midas VC list, Muddu has a nickname. His name is Magic Muddu. No. So they're in the Midas list. They, they, they get the credit of turning things into gold, but it's the entrepreneurs like Muddu behind the scenes who, who make the magic happen. Muddu has exited five companies that he started from scratch, raised capital, and sold to companies like EMC, VMware, Magna Design, uh, Brocade, and most recently, uh, cybersecurity firm uh, Capsida to uh, Splunk for nearly 200 million. Uh, Manish, in the last five years, 
has closed 18 transactions. So think about it. That's almost at the pace of one transaction a quarter. There is a transaction he's thinking about of a company that he's going to buy. There's probably five. He's going to end up buying one. Uh, so that's, that's the velocity of, of deal experience. And you know, earlier in the sessions, uh, Shalini had talked about you know, mixing personal life with, with business life and things that you do. My kids are at the tech uh, center of innovation today, it's tech museum. And the most fascinating panel they had, or oh, not panel, the most fascinating uh, you know, toys or tools that they saw were in cybersecurity. It was about teaching how hacking happens in computers. And here on this panel, I'm you know, happy to tell them, I got two of the pro cybersecurity guys uh, talking to me. So that's, that's fantastic. But go to Manish. He has the checkbook. <laughs> you should line up. If you, have a, if you have a company now, you should line up on the mic and ask him a question. And that's true. So we want to keep this interactive, and and uh, you know, as as we cover the first part of the section, you know, how companies get valued and how can you increase the value. If you have questions, uh, just come on over to the mic, fire them away, and we'll try to address them. We want to keep it interactive, so we're addressing things that are that are most interesting to you. Uh, you know, now now, Manish, you've you've seen transactions at at every stage. You you've bought companies, and I had a chance to study through you know, some of the publicly available materials. You've bought companies that are acu hires, that are technology buys, that are at a stage where the revenue is you know growing at a healthy clip, and then uh, you've paid what I call really premium valuations, like 10, 15 times revenue. Uh, You've been there, you've seen it all, and, and you're here to tell us all, right? No, no, no secrets and stuff. Uh, so what, what is it that, that in your mind, or in your analysis, or, or, or the magic that happens in your boardrooms that helps you decide this company is worth, you know, maybe three times revenue, this company is worth 10 times revenue, this company is worth maybe 50% of the capital that went in. How do you make those decisions? Yeah, there is a lot in that question, by the way. So it's, it's very hard to just describe in a few words. But if I just look back over the last six years, so Proofpoint, when I joined them, was 300 million in market cap. So it was a very small company. Uh, and I think the approach we took was there was an opportunity to consolidate the existing market we were in. And consolidation multiples tend to be rather low because you're really trying to pick up market share, you're picking up a customer base, you're picking up an install base that you can actually go sell more product to. And then there were a set of growth initiatives that we went and invested in, which tend to be the more higher multiple one, the higher growth ones. So I think there's always a balance you need to come up with, which is at what point in time, given where you are in your own development, where would you go put your chips? And both opportunities can be equally lucrative from a financial perspective, uh, because I'm always amazed in the prior panel, the hall was full, and I'm always reminded of my IIT days, which is when it comes to innovative technology, there's lots of people who want to sit in it. When it comes to trying to figure out how do you make money, the hall is only half full. So it's phenomenal, right? So don't look at if it isn't if it isn't considered sexy in today's world, you can't make money. That isn't true. There is lots of ways to make money in tech. Um, and we've proven it over and over again. I mean, Proofpoint today trades at eight, nine times forward revenues. And you'd say the core business, which is email security, is a fairly boring, steady, mundane business. But that shouldn't be the way investors think about it. So, so you know, Let's, let's take a recent transaction that you did. And, and again, you, know, you, you don't have to share anything. And if you need to edit it, we'll edit it. And you're not speaking for your company and things like those. But you know, talk me, walk me through you know, what were the, the forces of you know, what was driving you to pay that extra dollar and, and how were you able to push back so it's not the extra dollar plus two dollars? Yeah, so I mean. I tend to stick to four basic tenets in any acquisition that I do. And part of it is what, you know, what drives us as a company. So the first and foremost is it needs to be a cloud-enabled solution. Because you know the cloud is eating every aspect of tech, whether it's cybersecurity or any other part of it. So the last thing we want is to come up with a business model which meshes 
you know, on-prem deployment versus cloud deployment, it gets very confusing for the company, for our customers, for the sales teams. So first and foremost, it has to be cloud enabled. Second, it has to be something we should be able to sell in a subscription offering. Again, very difficult to get your enterprise sales guys trying to sell a perpetual license along with a subscription. It never works. So we've tried to stick very hard to a subscription model. Third, and this is probably the most important thing, and we can spend more time on it if you know, people want, is you need to decide what your go-to-market motion is. At the end of the day, no matter how innovative your technology is, the people who are selling it, they need to be able to understand it, say it, convince the buyer, you as the principal cannot go and convince every customer. So figure out what your go-to-market motion is, make sure you don't deviate from it, make sure it's repeatable. So any acquisition that we do has to fit into that same go-to-market motion. And fourth, it's all about the people. So to the extent you find great minds, I'm happy to pay a premium. And again, we can talk about nuances as to how you want to retain those people. But if you stick to your own version of three or four basic tenets, any asset that hits all four would end up, end up getting a premium because that's how you want to view that company. So, Mudu, how, do you, how did you look at transactions when, when you were out there in the market representing a company for a sale? Uh, can, you, can you talk about some instances on you know, what happened and how did you get the best value for, for the employees uh, for the founders, yourself, and for the investors. Sure. So, I mean, I want to comment on a few things that Manish also mentioned. I think, look, I kind of agree with Manish on most things, but I think something different viewpoint. Again, they, they both are representing the buy side and the other right. I'm going to give you the view of an entrepreneur side. Uh, I think, look, he mentioned a few things, being a security company like cloud and subscription is important, but yes, those, those things are table stakes and software and cloud and AI is going to eat the world, so whatever you do, you should be doing. Like if you're building a box company, I mean, I would quit your jobs and look for somewhere else, right? I mean, you don't want to be in an, even a network security or a storage, s selling boxes. I don't think may, not too many buyers are there. Even whoever is left is gone. I mean, EMC is gone, HP is gone. Who is left? Only Dell. I mean, or go to Lenovo or Huawei or something. So box companies are pretty much dead. So outside of that, I think the key thing for pricing, I think that goes back to Sunil, your earlier question is, look, there's a lot you can do there. I think uh, first is, obviously, you need to have a good team. Team is very important. Location, right? Right now, all these cloud providers to top companies, including Proofpoint, I'm sh again, depends on whether you have the view or not. Uh, when people approach us or when people are talking to companies, location is important. If your team is in China, India, wherever it is, that team is very 100 times less valuable than if the team is in Peria, period. Right? So location, Seattle here matters a lot. If the team is in Tel Aviv or if the team is in San Diego, you get one tenth or one hundred. So location matters a lot for the teams. It also matters a lot in terms of, he talked about go to market. Having customers is very important. But if you have a repeatable sales motion and your sales are doing great, I mean, you don't have to sell it that, right? I mean, if you are seeing a light under the tent, sometimes you may want to walk away. But I think even if you don't have any go to market, at the end of the day, the best value you can create is you got to have a vision of a true North Star, where you want to go, right? I actually like to, I mean, when you are actually building something, you want to create a product or a company, or is it a separate BU that they don't have, right? That's very important. If I'm creating a substrate that they do not have, I can command a premium, right? That's very important. So if you're the feature that's adding on top of XYZ, you're going to get so much. So I think there's a lot of ways you need to look at the space that you are in, what you want to do, how do you build a company based on that? And I think once you decide between company, product, the white spaces are large enough, uh, you can, all those things will help you in the process. So let's, let's talk about that as it relates to Capsida. How did you go about you know, those, those decisions when you started? Now, when, when you started Capsida, you'd already done a few you know, uh, successful exits prior to that. How did you go about selecting, like you said, geography, Maybe that was an easy choice because you were based in the Bay Area. How do you select the initial people? How did you select the initial investors? Uh, the product versus, are you going to be a platform, point solution, or a business? How did you go about those? I think you've laid out the, the factors quite well. How do you make those choices when you've not seen the future? Right. And, and those, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. I'm sure, Manish, you have different thoughts. So I think, look, these are the decisions that makes or break a company. So very early on when you start, your founding team is very important. 
Uh, I mean, that's why I tell people, one-person teams are never interesting to me to invest also. You want to have two, three people. You need to know who is your CTO, who plays the business role, who is your product role. Right? Like, you want to have the right DNA from day one that you start. And in terms of location, we talked already, but in terms of, I think, substrate versus, you have to go through a philosophy as to what you're trying to do. At least when we did Caspida, by the way, the company name is uh, Caspida, and it, when we did this 2013, I was at VMware still, and some of you guys remember Edward Snowden happened. Uh, you guys know who Edward Snowden is, right, in the room? And whatever it did, either it's a hero of the country or not, but you imagine if you're in October 2013 or 14 of uh, beginning, Every security company sales guys are saying that I, I need a Snowden use case. That was like, if you are at RSA to VMware to EMC, that's what you're hearing. People wanted to find if there's a bad guy in my house. Is my employee becoming bad or not? I mean, all you had is all kinds of things. So there is no, I mean, what we talk about AI and machine learning to determine who is an insider, whether an outside guy is in your environment didn't exist. So my vision is, look, I always wanted to replace where there is a, a, a there's lack of automation. So the vision that time for us was, look, is there a way we can find threats? And who is an insider or an external threat? I will tell you, I may be wrong, but what is the choice you have? I will do better than an average security admin can do, and I'm going to tell you prescriptively. You can say I'm wrong. That model, people liked it. I mean, if you now cut short, in five years from now, since then, uh, if you walk into any security operation centers, most of them, like whether you go to Utah to New York City, most talk centers today are no people inside, right? They're all gone. Security admins that you know will be like, it's mainly a DevOps, SREs even, that will be gone. Like if you look at what Andy Jesse is talking about, Amazon CEO, in next four or five years, if you are doing DevOps, IT operations, you should run, look for another job. They'll be gone, right? They're going to automate all those operations. That, that function doesn't exist from the cloud perspective. So if you have that type of vision and say, look, I'm going to create an another platform, and then what will happen is you will command your own premium then, right? You are a true visionary. And you have to back it up with a product that works. Uh, like Mani said, you got to get customers who are willing to pay for it. Is customers going to pay you a dollar, 10,000, a million dollar per year? That matters a lot. And so, Manish, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, Mudu, all of that makes a ton of sense. But it's very hard to create platform companies. And, you know, I've been of the mindset that most companies that are funded today are actually features of an existing or a newer product. Mm -hmm. All spaces, including the UEBA market that you're referring to, which is insider threat, they've all been consolidated. So it is okay to start a company as long as you have a unique idea, a unique way to solve a problem, knowing fully well the most likely path is an m and path at the end. And it's great if you can come up with a platform play, but those are few and far between. Right. Again, I, w I wasn't saying it's platform. Uh, point is that you want to, it can be an app company, and you never want to say as a startup you're an app company, uh, or a platform company. Nobody will fund you as an investor. You want to solve a problem, business problem, that's an app. Mm -hmm. But you want to command in a white space. If I can put a rabbit versus an elephant in that white space is what I look for. Right? That makes a big difference. And is that going to be, become the next future substrate for those companies? Right? So is your team going to build the next proof point, or next Splunk, or next VMware? That's what people look for. Those things, you'll get a lot of premium. So if you want to maximize the value for an M&A exit, focus on the white space, focus on the market, figure out who are the right people who will command a premium. Uh, and obviously, the space that we're talking about, like cybersecurity or high tech, and, and we've talked about blockchain and AI in the earlier panels, you've got to go out there and raise venture capital. So when you look at buying companies, does it matter how much VC money they've raised, who the VC is, uh, or, or any of those things? Because you know, many of the VCs can also, if the asset is hot and the, and the market is hot, then you can have multiple VCs competing. Uh, is there a decision that an entrepreneur can make that'll make the company more valuable in, in a buyer's eyes. I know Sunil is waiting for me to say something scandalous, but I really don't care who the VCs are. Uh, at the end of the day, look, no matter who's funded the company, they need to have marquee customers, enough customers for me as a buyer to go talk to the customer, which I will in every case. 
and I want to convince myself that the customer went through a rigorous process in buying that particular product, who else did they evaluate, what were the decision criteria, and I think all of those things are very important. Now, what has happened in today's funding environment is the rounds that people raise in series A and B are a multiple of what they used to do years gone by. So suddenly, that becomes a gating item that if a company has raised 30, 40 million, many VCs are obviously loath to selling it below the money that they've put in, even if the company isn't doing very well. So you find groups of companies now in the Valley that are kind of struggling to get to the next level, but the amount of funding that they've raised and the post-money valuation is kind of a roadblock to getting a transaction done. Any, any questions or thoughts from the audience on, on any of these topics? Please come on, come on up. There's a mic and we'll take, just come on up and we'll take the question. And I'll comment yeah, on this question. Yeah. So I had a question for Mudu. Um, like as a, you have gone through a lot of uh, exits, but uh, as an early entrepreneur, uh, you have a tension between uh, the investor side and like you want to go for an ac early acquire, which can help you as a, a first exit. Uh, because like if you have some employees, you look, it may be good for you to go for early exit and not take as much capital because I see a lot of people taking a lot of capital and then uh, end up like not being able to sell the company which can be good for their employees because the investor interests conflict with that. Uh, do you see a difference between your first company, like how you, like even we, when we look at Elon Musk's first company, which was like Zip2, like early exits, uh, the, seems like unless you're very wealthy, it's good to go for early exits initially and then um, go for a very let, big let, thing. Let me, I think, I think I understood your question. Let yeah. me rephrase that question. There is always a conflict between, you know, you, whether you exit today or you think you're up to something, you raise more capital and you exit at a higher multiple later, but for the entrepreneurs, there's a higher hurdle of performance as opposed to taking liquidity. How do you decide or how do you evaluate the different forces of exiting today versus exiting tomorrow at high? So bird in hand, bird in bush, how do you decide? And then I want to hear your perspective, mm -hmm. how should a seller decide? Yeah, very good question. It's always a classical question that you always go through when you get an offer. So first of all, I think let's look at your question and also earlier what Manish talked about. Look, you don't wake up and first of all, no entrepreneur in this room or anywhere should say, I mean, unless you are already decided that you have to do m and in that case, you should engage somebody like Sunil. You have an investment banker like him, so he'll help you. So I think, look, if you wake up and say you need a banker, you should get a banker immediately and get some good bankers. There are lousy bankers and good bankers. But if you don't have a banker, then what will happen is you want to wait for an offer to come in, right? You're actually building the company. You don't wake up and say, I want to sell my company. The moment you put a sell sign on you, your price drops by 100, right? Manish will eat you. He's a shark. If he smells the blood, he'll get even more blood, all right? <laughs> so you don't go to him and say, I want to sell the company, uh, right? You just want to give you a... I mean, or, or, or if you do have a good banker with you. Right. Or if you have Sunil, he can handle that. So he's, a, he's in the middle between both of us, right? right? Uh, but to the point, look, if you get an offer or you want to do something, right, it's, you, you have to be, you don't do what is good for you. First of all, you'll get only one vote. Uh, unless you structure your board like what the Facebook guys and Google guys are like, you have the uh, um, board control votes. Like when, if you go to classical venture rounds, VCs have the board seat, you have one vote or two votes, your co-founders have some votes, and your VCs have it. So usually you have to evaluate your offer. How credible is the offer? Um, what you want to do with that and how, what is it like? There are times, that's why I think Manish was referring to like, not all VCs are the same. If you have a bad VC and that's his first job and he wants to show that he's returned a return for his venture firm, he wants you to sell the company. So he'll be calling you 10 times a day and say, take the offer, take the offer. So you as a CEO, you have to be careful. Similarly, if you have an employee, early co-founder never smelled money and you suddenly start showing that he'll make X, Y, Z million dollars, he can't sleep. He's already thought about what Tesla, what house he want to buy in uh, some Palo Alto. So, and it's a toxic culture after that. It's a slippery slope, right? So once you start say you don't disclose that to your co-founders too. So I actually have a good formula there. I say, look, usually if you are on the team, you should be the CEO, should be the lone founder on the board. I mean, you, the more co-founders you have, and first of all, it creates a different dynamics because you and them, they're reporting to you, but they're on the board. It just doesn't work well. And in this kind of situation, that 
you can't keep that secret. The second thing is get an independent board of directors. Get, I mean, there are plenty of people in the valley. I've mentioned this thing like people like Ram Shriram, who is on the board. Like, there's a reason Ram is on the board of Google from day one. He's a founding Google board member, right? Go with them. I'll take like uh, Andy Bechtelsheim from Arista Networks and Cisco, Dan Warman Owen from Palo Alto board, right? And these guys will take com uh, companies' board seats. When they take those board seats, they represent the company's common fiduciary duties. So they will come and put the sanity when the VC want to sell or you want to sell. Somebody has to wear the people's rights. Right? That's very important. Now, it, let me just add one more thing to it. So if I was to put myself in your shoes, if you are at that point where you're looking to raise another round of money which would dilute your ownership to below majority control, I wouldn't do it. So remember, at the end of the day, you are only, your say is only as important as what votes you control. And I've been in far too many situations where the founders and the companies were at that point where they were looking to raise money, their next round they would have diluted themselves and they found that they just lost control of the situation. And as a buyer, those were actually in a way some of my best deals where I knew that the VCs and the founders were at loggerheads. But from your perspective, if you believe you can get to an exit before you get to that eventuality, that obviously makes a lot of sense. Let me add to that. So I, I kind of agree with him, but I don't agree on one point, which is, uh, yes, obviously, look, if you're getting diluted, you can do all that. But the, to determine a price is right, I think, Sunil, that was your earlier question. You, if you get an offer, reject an offer. Like, all of you guys have, like, when your spouses came to you, she rejected you or you rejected her. <laughs> like, you want to be like, play hard to get. I mean, I usually reject, play a good poker game, go to Las Vegas, learn the game, right? Reject the offer. The more you reject it, more Manish wants you, right? That's how Manish would work. I don't know. You can test him today, right? <laughs> I'll see, right? So you got to reject the offer. Then you know, you know the elasticity of the price. He'll increase it. Reject him again. Until the point when he starts rejecting, then you go back, right? So uh, then you know you reach the point that I want to sell now or should I go there? So you got to have that formula in your mind. And I think all of that is probably true, but I will say far too many times we all get caught up in what's the right price. I have X number of engineers, or I have Z number of customers, yeah. or Y amount of revenue. You know, at the end of the day, a fair price is what a willing buyer is willing to pay for an asset that's acceptable to a willing seller. There is no comp, no nothing that works. So just realize that as you go through these motions, same when you're raising money, same when you're finding a home for your company. And I think the other thing you should just keep in mind is the valley is a very small place. You've made one exit, just realize, unless you were gonna take your money and, and leave, which would be fine, if you were gonna stick around, reputations are everything in the valley. So just make sure when you get to an exit, you are taking care of your employees mm. and shareholders first before the founders take care of themselves. And that will pay you dividends I can't even quantify because that reputation would be golden for a long time. No, I agree with them. So one thing that uh, very important that I've done in my companies and others is you want to create a, make sure that there's enough share is given back to the employees, carve out some things uh, that everybody makes money and particularly you want to fight for the, the lowest employee with equity in the company, somebody should fight his or her rights. And the more you do that, the more people will follow you. But I think those are some, some valuable nuggets. Uh, any further questions? Just anyone has questions, please come on, just stand in line and, and I'll take the questions as they come up. Uh, so valuable nuggets there, you know, who you get on your team at the founding level is extremely important. Who you bring on your board is extremely important. Mm -hmm. The role the VC gets in the company is extremely important. Who the VC is, not so much. What matters is what the market is and what the customers are saying about you. Just because you have customers doesn't mean everything. Mm -hmm. Did they do enough rigor in selecting you? Were they the toughest customers you could get? So those are, those are some of the things that I'm picking up. And uh, let, me, let me kind of take it to, to you know, the, the exit point. Now, can you give me an example? Now, you, you can give me names, and I'd love it if you give names, but if you don't, we understand where you had a thesis that you took to the board and based on which you priced the asset, 
So give me an example where things worked out much better than you had ever imagined. Give me an example where, where they didn't. And what were the, what were the reasons? Because one way money gets made in M&A is by the buyers buying assets, obviously at prices that were less than what they're worth to them. And that's when a transaction would happen. So can you give me an example where you, where you overbet what were the parameters around that and where obviously it was a home run what were the kind of parameters around that? Because obviously the note you want to take is you want to have the buyer perceive that buying your assets will be a home run. I, I think one thing that is true in m and and probably true in life, you will never have thought through every outcome. So you should be prepared to be surprised as to what happens a couple of years down the road. So some of the acquisitions that we did um, where I think in a lot of ways we were too early to the market. So one acquisition or two acquisitions, they were around social media security and compliance. So as we sell our suite of security and compliance tools, I think the thesis was there's going to come a time where companies are going to be using social media, think of Facebook, LinkedIn, for more than just advertising. They're going to use that to go reach out to their constituents. And just the way they use other business forms of communication the security teams would want controls put on social media. And I think that, as a thesis, seemed fine. And the acquisitions that we did, this is what led me to the number three rule that I'd laid out earlier. What we found is the buyer for those assets tended to be the digital marketing team, not the security team. And it gets increasingly hard for enterprise sales guys to go figure out who has budget for my particular product. How do I convince them to go give me money for this? And if it's two or three or four different buyers at that same enterprise, it is very complicated. So I think one of the learnings that we had is just make sure it is cohesive from a go-to-market standpoint, which in spite of a fairly robust, high-level thinking didn't work out in the end, at least to the extent that I thought it would. In some markets, we were just way too early. So there are markets like security orchestration and remediation today, which is where Splunk has made a more recent acquisition. We were in that market four years before Splunk had bought an asset for like 23 million. Splunk recently paid almost 400 million. So being early at times, you can get assets for cheaper, uh, but it might take a longer time for your thesis to play out. Uh, things where I've been surprised to the upside, I think those were just happenstance. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you I had this vision and that's what happened in the end. It was, in a lot of cases, right place at the right time. So if, if you have a buyer, make sure they know they're the right place at the right time. How about you, Madhu? You know, some, some situations where you were able to extract a little bit more, maybe there was a negotiating tactic you used, or maybe there was some posturing involved, or? Yes, yes, a lot of things you can do. Uh, <laughs> so I think, look, um, as Manish was saying, I have different thoughts on that side, so let me give you where it's, look, when, as you said, whenever you do and how much are you negotiate, first of all, any negotiation try to be, as you said, you as a CEO, assuming you guys are CEO or CEO, there will be one person negotiating it, and other person will be somebody like Manish on their side, and including their CEO. At, the, at some point, you're going to meet the company CEO, right? It's not just the banker and the person you're doing your corp development. You're shaking a hand with him, verbal commitment. Be true to that, per, that agreement. From your side, I can't, I mean, there's a reason why EMC VMware bought me three times, like Joe Tucci and Paul Murray. Whatever I say, I deliver that. I mean, they keep coming back. And I get, every time they bought me, first time they didn't keep me enough, second time they locked me for a year, then two years. So, I mean, whatever they do, if you do that, people will come back. So reputation is really important from that perspective. Um, but I think you have to also understand that when somebody buys it, there's a lot of pyramid. Was that, are you going to be the, what are the things you guys agreed upon? Are you going to run the division? Is there somebody else is going to run? And what is going to do with your team? Is it a separate SKU? Is this a technology integration that Manish talked about earlier? You have to think through all of those things, right? Usually, uh, there's so many surprises will happen. At some point, you need to write these things down, right? You should never stay beyond your, wel out, your welcome. When somebody buys it, look, they have a plan for you. Unless you, there's only one CFO, they take it. They already have a CFO. There's only one CEO, right? Unless you want to the company CEO, you should plan to at some point. So it depends on what your ambitions are, right? If you're a true alpha character, you want the CEO, then you should tell, say, hey, I want to be the CEO. Be very upfront, right? Or if you don't want, just plan your exit out. 
So negotiate these things as early on as you can. And once you remove all the surprises, then you know when you want to leave, they know where it is, there's no hard feelings, come, everything. So you need, and get the best lawyer. There's one thing I always tell uh, entrepreneurs, like you never want to skimp on a doctor and a lawyer. The M&A lawyer and the banker like that you're going to get is the most important thing. The reason is the lawyer can save you a lot of money and give you a lot of good advice. These lawyers will be very uh, crucial for you in terms of negotiating for your employees and you and your team. So, go ahead. There are about five minutes left to go. Maybe you can start thinking about like three hidden secrets that you'd like to share with the, the group as we uh, wrap up. So, so I'm Ashish Prasad from ITPHU 96 batch. A question for both of you guys about customers. So when you are uh, selling your company, what do you tell your customers? Like, you know, what, how would the new culture be? And when you bought a company, how do you make sure that the customers are still, you know, comfortable with you and they believe in the, in the vision that the previous founder had? Let, let, let me frame the question differently. As a, as a buyer, you want to get to the customer as soon as you can. As a seller, you want to make sure they get to the customer at the very end. How do you manage that process? It's, it's a standard process today, right? I mean, most banking process today is there. Like, you have to, depending on the agreement you have, you may have to get a signature approval and you reach out to the customer partner, tell them under NDA that there is something happening, you need approval. But assuming the transaction related, you have to do it. Outside of transaction, if you are changing the product, you have to tell them to be open and honest. There's nothing like, hey, this company is going to roll this out as a feature or this is going to be a separate product, it's going to be skew. I mean, you tell the truth as it is. They'll follow you. And what, what have you noticed are the main concerns that the customer have when you bring an M&A type topic to them? I think if somebody paid you, again, it depends on how much they If they paid millions of dollars, the question is, are you going to be there? Is this product going to be discontinued? How much help are there? Is, a, is it going to be just a support? Are you going to feature rich this product or not? Right? Customers are thinking about, they didn't just buy you at that point in time. In, right? Their body is saying that you're going to deliver a roadmap over the next four or five years. As long as you're going to continue to convey that, that you're going to be there behind that, they will be behind you. But it's very important what you're asking. So customers and partners, you want to make sure they're taken care of in the MA process. But can I ask, your question is driven by, does the customer have a consent right in the agreement? No, I mean, customers usually said that before the acquisition, some promises were made that this is the roadmap. Now the new buyer comes in and they say, I don't care about the roadmap. This is how we are going to integrate your product. And the customer is very you know, concerned. Do I go to a different company, right? You know, so uh, as a buyer, what do you do to convince the customer, no, we are going to be committed to you, don't run, you know, especially for a big customer. Do you like talk to the top 10 customers after the acquisition or how do you handle that situation? Yeah, we do. So we talk to all the quote unquote big customers and it's driven by what market it is and what we would consider to be a key customer. But if there is a consent right, I can just tell you right now that's a problem. If there's a change of control provisions in your agreements with the customer, because many big savvy customers realize that smaller companies will get acquired, and many a times they will put in change of control provisions, which is if anybody buys your company, they have the right to cancel the contract. And I can tell you right now that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So just be mindful as you're going and getting these customers, and it's great to get some tier one customers, they have all the negotiating power when you are a small company, but realize it's going to create issues for you in an exit. So that's a red flag for you. Yeah. Right. So assignment of contracts, that's, that's an important piece as you're building the, the link. Was there another question out there? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I'm Mohinder Sika. So my question is about uh, due diligence. Uh, what I heard was uh, companies in the Valley are now taking many months, like the big acquirer will sometime take two months to complete their due diligence. So you have a handshake, uh, Mudu, you have an agreement. So question is for uh, Mudu, you know, how, how do you handle the risk during due diligence process? What do you not share? Or uh, how do you make sure you still complete the transaction? There's no one size fits all. So I, I always propose people that uh, if they take 60 days or 90 days during that time, I mean, once you go through the term sheet, you sign it, you see through the truth to that extent, but uh, sometimes you may, uh, I prefer you actually put a money if they walk out, unless there is some fraud or something that you can define that. Many buyers don't like that. 
But lately, I mean, if the thing is important, that's one way to test it. Is this guy really serious or not? I mean, you can tell it sometimes based on the person you're talking to, as Manish said, like, if you're serious with Manish or not, you can read the web and you may take a risk. But I highly recommend that you put a skin in the game, some dollar game on both sides. You're investing your 60, 90 days because it's going to be a distraction to all your team. And if something falls through, for some big company, $5 million is nothing. $10 million is nothing. No, I think... Uh, well, Muddu, I, let, let me stop you there. <laughs> You're magic, Muddu. You can get away with that. I represent sell side all day long. Don't even go there. As a private company, there is nothing like a breakup fee. The way you do that, and, and you might find this hard to believe, but you hold the buyer accountable. If you said 40 days, 60 days, demand a work plan, and if they're not sticking to that work plan, challenge them. What's going on? And as long as they give good reasons, you're okay. No, no, I was going to just agree with you that there is no breakup fee for a private company. You won't be able to get a dollar out of nope. me if you wanted Absolutely. a breakup fee. So it is all driven by if somebody says I need 90 days to do diligence, that is a ridiculously long period of time. So anything more than 30, maybe at the low end, maybe 45, they're wasting your time. Okay. Thank you. So I think we yeah. pretty much have one minute to go. Final thoughts on you know, best three, four, five <coughs> secrets that we can kind of collectively come out for, for people? Oh, you're asking? Uh, look, guys, I mean, build a company for value. Um, uh, just be true to yourself, carry through your vision. Uh, look, uh, animal spirits are unleashed by our President Trump. Best time to make money in the next eight, six years. <laughs> what the heck are we doing? I mean, I mean, people like public companies, they have to buy money. They have, there's so much cash. Just keep building it. Create the value. There's money to be made for all of us. Party time, guys. Just enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> need... So well, it's, it's always hard to beat that when, when Mudu says party time. But there's only one thing I'll say. Just realize the people you're dealing with at the other end, they're also normal, regular human beings. So to the extent you are very open with what you're looking to do, what your own vision is, what's going to drive, what is driving you in that particular transaction, what do you think about your employees and how you want to take care of them. A merger agreement and, you know, all the clauses in it won't help you if you don't have a good handshake understanding with the other side. So just be honest, down to earth, just go for here's what you're looking for and you'd be surprised what you get, you know, in reciprocity from, you know, the buyer. Great. So I think, I think there, was, there was a lot of material covered out there and if I would kind of try to summarize many of those points, I think at every stage of the company's life cycle, uh, not forefront and, and center, but there are things you can do that will affect the eventual enterprise value of the company at the earlier stages, how you define your product, how do you define your market, how do you pick your teams, which venture capitalists you take on. But the most important thing always remains is customers and, and getting the tough customers has more value than getting the not so tough customers. Um, how you set the expectations both with your customers, how you structure their contracts when it comes to assignment clauses, and then when you're negotiating the deal, you know, making sure that you deliver or you promise what you know you can confidently deliver because you're setting up your reputation, especially in these circles, in the valley, it's a small group. Uh, if you build that repeatable uh, experience, whether you're on the buy side, where you know, you're doing 18 transactions, one transaction a, a quarter, by clockwork, people will shake hands with you, they know they have a deal or they don't have a deal. And, and as a sell side, if you're doing multiple transactions over your career, they will go back and they will check how you performed in your last acquisition and is this guy someone who does what he says he's going to do. So. That's with those, you know, hidden secrets and nuggets. Hopefully, uh, this was this was a, a good experience for all of you. I want to thank our our panelists. Well, thank you so much, guys. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. This was uh, this was a very very entertaining panel, I have to say, and a very frank and open panel. It's very rare that you hear such open advice uh, in this topic, which is usually very sensitive. I'm actually kind of surprised to see that we don't have more attendance, but hey, you know. That's good, unfair advantage for you. You learn something that others didn't. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank our speakers uh, with a small gift, and I would like to invite Padma to hand out the gifts.